Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Streche. You know, when I think about the promise and power of AI, I really, the biggest use case that attracts me and interests me is in the medical field. Yeah, I, I, I look at it and go, there is so much that you could do and what we hear about, and it's traditional AI. It's not the new, it's even, it's not new, even the new stuff. gen exactly. AI. It's what you know, people have been doing with ML for years, and I, I think that's what excites me, is there's a lot of history with this, and it's just going faster now. Yeah, there's a lot you can do with the old-fashioned inference stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so a, a perfect segue to our next guests. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ellen Grant and Dr. Rudolf Pinier. He, they are both from Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Thank you both so much for hey, coming on the show. Us. And returning to the show, I know you're both <laughs> CUBE alums. So I think a good place to start is to talk about how AI is used in clinical settings because even though there is so much promise and potential, it's actually not used that, that much. Can you t talk a little bit about, about the lay of the land and where we are now, Dr. Grant? Yeah, sure. Um, Typically in radiology, it's not used that often once the images is at our table. There's some AI baked into image acquisition, so there's deep learning acquisitions. So it's in the, the sequence acquisition, for example, in MR and for some denoising. But by the time it gets to us, like to the images, we just read them still. So there's not much more other than that. It's all visual perception and, um, and uh, interpreting the images. And there's very little AI that happens to the image once it gets to our hands. And the, the reason for that is it's really hard to then take AI algorithms and put them into our clinical workflow. So there's a lot of people jostling to have access to provide us that, um, that analysis before it gets in our hands, but very few things actually have made it. Okay, okay. And so how is Boston Children's Hospital using AI right now to make decisions? Well right now we're developing tools to be able to improve our ability to do decision making and we're focusing mostly on the image analysis part uh, in terms of physician assisted uh, diagnosis. So it's not, AI is not making decisions for us, we're trying to get AI to simplify things for us like decrease the cognitive load was a word I heard this morning which I really resonate <laughs> with that concept and to also give us quantitative data when before we were just looking at something, so to give us numbers, because if we can measure it, we can look at how we can improve outcomes or how different treatments have an impact, whereas um, qualitative assessments are much less precise. Okay. Yeah. I, I think what's really interesting is that, and we've talked about this a little bit up leading up to this, is that we're at an, basically an open source conference. I mean, Red Hat is, the foundation of Red Hat is open source. Really, when you look at it, medicine, as we were talking about, makes a lot of sense from an open source perspective. How do you both see it from like working with Red Hat, open source, medicine, working with other hospitals for that matter? Because yeah. again, that, that becomes where it can be really exciting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Do you want to start with that one? So I would say it's fundamental to how we see things. It's open source, open science, right? We're not in the business to try and be proprietary about the things we do. That's not what it's about. We're about getting things out there to help the most, the maximum number of people possible. So the link with Red Hat is completely natural because if we develop tech that runs on a platform, I want everyone to use it, without a doubt, right? Um, but medicine is a strange environment as well from a tech perspective because in some ways it's very advanced, but in some ways from a computing perspective, it's very 1990s. So a lot of stuff doesn't happen, but a lot, of, a lot of stuff is about to happen. And I quite feel quite passionately that if we can get in with an open source approach to distributing this stuff, we can have a new way of doing things that isn't the old way where vendors come in, each one sells their particular product, they don't work together, they don't talk to each other, and we don't advance the field forward. So I think open source really levels that completely. And what I really like about working with Red Hat and OpenShift, for example, is we can create our own platform, which is Chris, 
on OpenShift and then we can give it to somebody else who's running OpenShift and it runs out of the box. You know, when we're trying to take algorithms from other sites, even if they're containerized, by the time we bring them to our site and try to run them, that's two, three weeks of a, a highly sophisticated team's work to get it running. So there's so much overhead to take other people's tools. So if we put it in a Chris environment on OpenShift, it becomes easily shareable to anybody that's running OpenShift. And as we were talking about earlier today, and then if we put it in an open cloud, like the Mass Open Cloud, then people who don't have compute resources on-prem have access. So that what really excites me is to be able to put more algorithms inside Chris so everybody can access to it, to it and for everybody it runs in the same manner. So we have our favorite tools, but I'd love other people to put their tools in as well so we can have a community that actually shares those resources in a platform that makes it easy to do, do that last mile. Because that's something we've been passionate about for years is this Chris platform it, it doesn't end up on my computer at my research office. It ends up in the workstation where I'm reading the cases. And if it doesn't do that, it's not going to make it into clinical practice. And what, what is Chris? Because you've said it now. I'm always big and I always get it called out for using <laughs> acronyms. So I'm, I'm going to call you guys out for that. What, what does Chris stand for? So it used to stand for the Children's Research Integration System. But as time went on, it just became recursive and it became the Chris Research Integration System. Because you know, I'm kind of nerdy, so that tracks. <laughs> it's good. Um, but what it really is, it's a way, it's something that sits on top of OpenShift and brings a more kind of desktop type experience to running your apps. That's probably the best way to describe it. It makes it very easy for researchers to get their programs on Chris, and then on Chris it can go into OpenShift. And they don't have to know anything about the cloud or anything like that, so that's a big win. So both of you were up on the main stage this morning um, at, at the Red Hat Summit talking about the strides you've made in maternal fetal healthcare using uh, Red Hat OpenShift for artificial intelligence. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about, about the progress that's being mm -hmm. made? Well, two of the favorite projects we were talking about today that we think are going to have a big impact. One is, um, you know, when fetuses, when we're imaging fetuses, and we do MRI in fetuses, because it's one of the most um, accurate diagnostic uh, modalities um, for, for, um, for fetal health. So we once, often we look at fetal brains, for example, and it's really hard because the fetuses are moving. We can't tell them to stay still, so they're moving <laughs> around, swimming around in the uterus as we're taking the images. So as you're taking images, what should be just straight images through a head like this, they're all over the place in different angles, and some are blurry because they've moved partly through the acquisition. Those babies. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> They'd only stay still. Um, so it, it, you end up then, we keep repeating and repeating and repeating, trying to get that perfect stack of images, so at the end I'm sitting there with maybe a thousand images that I have to look at and try to you know, reconstruct that brain in my mind to make sure I see every piece of it. When it's, and I'm spending so much time trying to reconstruct that brain. Now, what we've done in collaboration with MIT is develop an AI algorithm that works on OpenShift that takes all those images and reconstructs them and sort of shuffles them into place and gives me one coherent volume. And then I could just look at that coherent volume and quickly look at the brain like I would a, a, a brain after you're delivered. We can strap people down and hold them still, right? So this one gives me a coherent volume that I can just read very nicely. So I can put my brain power on the diagnostic component of it instead of the exhausting trying to put this back together you know, in my head instead of having a, an algorithm do it. So that's one algorithm. And then once we integrate it into the CRISP platform, we can put it right at the bedside. So we've got listeners in the Chris platform, so it listens for those images to be dumped into our PAX archive, our image archive, grabs them, runs the algorithm, puts it back on my desktop within five minutes. So we're just about to deploy that, and I'm really excited to see the impact it has on cognitive load and the accuracy of our diagnoses, because I think it's going to be so much easier and less exhausting to, do, to use a whole volume. Because the cognitive load is real. I yes. mean, we, we know yes. so much, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic, about yep. burnout in, yep. the, in the healthcare industry. And so if we can reduce that, yep. it, really, yeah. it really could change things. Yeah, and it gets to the point, Jeffrey Hinton's comment about I would be out of a job by now, um, is that you know, we're not anywhere near radiologists being replaced. Where we're trying to get to is that cognitive load. Because we are short staff, we work long days, and we barely look up from the computer screen. We really need help in just sorting things, making things easier. You know, it's going to be a long time until a computer and AI algorithm can make a, a clinical medical decision for us, but there's a lot that can be done to make 
it easier for us so we really focus on what we want to do, which is the diagnostic component. And you're also, this is also deployed as, or as part of the Massachusetts Open Cloud as well. Yes, it'll work mm -hmm. on the Open yes. Cloud as well too, but what we're working towards is wanting to get that HIPAA compliant. Because right now we can anonymize research data and put it up there temporarily, but if we really want a platform there that anybody could access, we need a HIPAA compliant environment. So that's what we're working on to try to get that set up so we can start to then deploy to you know, local hospitals or even move into LMICs, the, the low and middle income countries that only have the image acquisition um, devices but no compute power whatsoever. So being able to bring that to anybody is something we're really excited about too. Yeah, I've actually heard that from a radiology perspective, especially on the pharmaceutical side, where they're taking different, ang uh, different pictures from different angles from different machines, and how to, if they, they have to move it from one country to another country, and how they have to anonymize the data. And is, is that still, it, it, that would seem, I mean, again, you're Boston Children's Hospital, so you don't necessarily have that kind of thing, but when you're sharing the data, you do. So is that where uh, a lot of this how do you share the data, and is that how everybody's kind of working together to come try to look at formats and things yeah, of that nature? Yeah, we're looking at imaging. We have a DICOM format, so there's more of a standardization around images for most medical imaging. And then the other thing about the open cloud and being involved in the, that whole research environment is the potential to start to get the multi-party compute. So everybody has their own enclave, you know, within the cloud that you keep your own data private, but any algorithm can compute on any of the data. So that's hopefully where we'll get to. We still can share with other sites and institutions with special data use agreements, and then we share it in an anonymized fashion. I still, still think we can move forward in that manner. Many projects are going on that, uh, in that way, but it would be better to go to that next level and have everybody have their own environment so that we don't have to worry about all these data use agreements. How do you foresee this changing the culture of the hospital and, and of research in general? I mean, something you had said earlier, uh, Rudolph, about how we are, you, you described this moment of almost a precipice, that a lot has happened, but, but, a, but a lot still needs to happen and could happen. You see all this promise and potential. We're not quite there yet, but, but we're really almost there. Um, how do you foresee this really revolutionizing the way people do their jobs and, and also the way healthcare is delivered to, to us patients? Oh, completely. I think my day gets filled with a lot of drudgery. Anyone's day is, right? And if we can eliminate a lot of that, it, makes a, it begins to make a huge difference. You were just talking about the diacom anonymization. That's drudgery work. There's nothing sexy, there's nothing fancy about doing that. And people hate to do it because there are no tools that make it easy to do. So part of what we try to do is to make even the drudgery parts really easy. Because that's how you break down the barriers. In my experience, if someone needs to do anything beyond their normal workflow, they're not going to do it. Not easily. It has to be drop dead simple. So to do these kind of things, to have anonymization be in the platform will make hospitals or researchers much more able to be willing to contribute their data, especially under the HIPAA compliances and stuff like this. So I think from our perspective in medical imaging and data, we're very concerned about data provenance, data privacy, right? So I want to say you can trust that we would keep care, take care of the data. We're not going to use stuff in models that we don't know where it comes from, that you don't know where it comes from. That's, that's what we bake into our systems as well. And these kind of ideas, I think, really are now coming together and are going to just open the next level of floodgates, right? Um, where we can innovate at scales that we don't do today. And that's going to lead to a lot of exciting innovation. And that's another thing about, say, the mass open cloud that we really like is the data governance structure. It's not it in the hands of some commercial entity, it's in the hands of the academic institutions. And that makes me feel much more comfortable. And we think that's the way to go in terms of medical imaging that can actually support hospitals. How, how much are you in touch with other uh, people like you who are, who are both practitioners but also technologists too? I mean, I, I know we're here at the Red Hat Summit and there's not a lot of people who are, in the, who are in the healthcare field, but how much are you sort of bringing this open source philosophy to, to other people and, and talking to colleagues at other institutions? That's a great question. There are very few of us, unfortunately, right? 
but I think there are people all over the place. And I think there's a recognition coming that the importance of technology in medicine, especially computing technology, is really where it's at. A lot of medicine is still thinking in terms of pharmacology, right? That's 20th century. We're in the 21st century. Computing is what's going to break the new frontiers. And that idea <coughs> is beginning to come through. You know, forums like this, like the queue, getting the word out, this all contributes to getting that information out there. Well, a, a, yeah. a terrific note to end on both. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much, Dr. Ellen Grant and Rudolf Pinar. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Streche. We are done for the day, but come back tomorrow for more of theCUBE's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news.